Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, week two of 18th century Africa. Um, today, we will once again have um, two panels, um, one from 5 to 6.30 UK time, uh, looking at environments, um, and then one immediately following, um, looking at uh, memory. Um, so without any further delay or housekeeping, um, we're going to go straight to Atori Morales' um, presentation on the Baralong and smallpox. Thank you, Brian. And thank you all for organizing and all the presenters from last week for the, for the presentation. Um, shall I share my screen uh, for, with my presentation? So let's do it. Okay, and I need to close this. Okay, so, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night uh, to everybody. What I'm presenting today is um, a part of a book project I'm working on, which is based on my PhD. Um, but I must say only some parts of this uh, research have been going on for, for you know, quite a few time now. Uh, others are more experimental, more novel to me, uh, more recent, and actually this workshop, this conference has been uh, a great occasion to test my, uh, well, to test my nerves on these new fields. Um, so, to, to be very brief, um, I've been working on the Barolong as part of uh, my, my research for, for the PhD for years. And I've never worked on um, medical history or the history of medicine or the history of epidemics uh, that intensively before uh, a few months ago. So this is for me an occasion to, uh, um, you know, to uh, bring out some hypotheses and test some, uh, test some research questions. But um, first thing first, who are the Barolong? Um, well, the short answer is that it's very difficult to know. Uh, and please, I mean, those quotations, I mean, I'm not going to read them just for those of you who are keen to, you know, for, for, for the reading today. Um, but for just for a brief historiographical uh, introduction, um, well, if we look at books that have been written on the subject, it's very difficult to understand what we are talking about. It's a population, it's a people, it's a tribe or a state or a kingdom of the interior of Southern Africa. Um, Martin Legassic in 1969 was quite um, resolute in stating that uh, all we know is legend uh, and it's very difficult to understand anything uh, about their history. Um, more recently, uh, Paul Landau in a very influential book um, has analyzed this the history of the Barolong, uh, unpacking their um, historical discourse, uh, but still um, the you know the developments and events of uh, what took place in the 18th century in the era before colonialism uh, is very difficult to grasp in their in, in, in his work. And then we have on the Barolong, um, as quite often is the case in, in African history. Um, a huge repertoire of oral history and epic and literature, uh, which in this case is exemplified by Sertzele Modi Molema. And uh, finally, um, sources, written sources that tell us, uh, you know, these, these recollections from the 19th century, looking back into the 18th century, that tell us of a complex state or a kingdom uh, where the Barolongs would be uh, the ruling lineage or family, uh, but more importantly, well, with a lot of names of peoples and communities forming that kingdom, and more importantly, this notion of the land of Tau that comes across very strongly uh, from the sources uh, of the 19th century, Tau being uh, the most famous of their kings. Um, so there are only a few uh, points that I will um, address today as uh, when it comes to, to, to the history of the Barolong. 
um, this is the location. Uh, I mean, this is the, the, the landscape and the, situa the geographical situation we are discussing. Um, so those dots in the middle, Taung is their um, reputed uh, capital. The black dots are most, I mean, are the settlements that I was able to locate uh, through, I mean, by various means, including oral histories, uh, archaeology, and written sources. Uh, the two purple dots are the one in the south, Mapumugubwe, and the one in the north, uh, Great Zimbabwe. And you can see the three main colonial towns that are somehow relevant for their history. Um, this is more or less a representation of what I, I mean, what I can say about the situation of the Barolong in the 18th century, during the 18th century. Um, there are only a couple of, of you know, uh, of elements worth not, uh, mentioning today. And the first one is cities or urban history, if you'd like. Um, the land of Tao uh, was very likely a land of cities. Um, so Taung, the capital, wasn't the same large settlement. Um, but here we immediately arrive to the very first, I mean, to, the, to, to possibly the biggest issue in dealing with this, with this history being the lack of uh, written documents and description of those cities during the 18th century. The first one is uh, from the very beginning, I mean, the beginning of the 19th century, and it's a description of the town of Ditakong, Letaku. Um, now, this name might have, I mean, it's sometimes you, you hear it uh, even in general works on African history because it's the place of a battle uh, in 1823, you know, those of you who have heard about the Cobbing debate and the Fekane debate in Southern Africa might know uh, or might have heard about this battle, but this is much later. It's not the, you know, the, an issue that we're going to discuss today. Ditakong at the beginning of the um, 19th century was a large city. Um, and when the first Europeans arrived at the city, they realized it was, you know, as large as Cape Town as we can read here. Um, but more importantly, wasn't the only uh, one uh, in the in in this uh, you know um, kingdom or state. Uh, this is a, a representation made by I mean, is a, is a painting made by one of the uh, travelers during that first expedition. And I mean, I just want to draw your attention on uh, the density of the buildings uh, along the river. Um, as I said, this is not the only uh, the the only possibly large city, you can see it here uh, in the middle. I've, those with labels are the cities that could have been the same size, uh, Taung being maybe a, uh, a bit larger. So this, um, I mean, this, this kingdom was placed uh, on a sort of frontier zone between a very arid, uh, you know, Northwest and, and Southwest and an increasingly uh, fertile and wet, um, East and and, uh, and and northeast. Um, this is another depiction of Ditakong a few years later. And again, I just want to draw your attention on the density of the population of the settlement. The other element I'm going to discuss very briefly about the Barlong is trade, and particularly long distance trade. Um, we, I mean, it is possible, and this is something that uh, even Legasic started to do in, in the 60s, um, to draw a scheme or, a, you know, a very quick um, overview of what the trade system of the Barlong was like in the 18th century. Um, they were placed in the middle of Southern Africa, as we have seen, and um, they were conveniently placed close to uh, important uh, trade routes. Uh, those were the goods that they exchanged. As you can see, for example, they imported iron and copper and they exported iron and copper uh, in the other direction. So uh, this included, you know, metal working uh, within uh, the kingdom. Uh, one important point is uh, the, uh, the import of glass beads from uh, colonial ports, which is uh, um, a strong issue uh, with them because of the lack of uh, excavation on, on the on you know on the territory of their kingdom. Um, one of the most important evidence of long distance trade comes from the travels of Robert Jacob Gordon, 
um, uh, Dutch explorer and soldier who gets to uh, just to the border of uh, the Barolong uh, in 1778, 1779, and then draws this huge atlas of Southern Africa, of which you can see uh, a small uh, fragment here. Uh, what you see is the course of the Orange River, which was drawn for the first time by uh, Jacob uh, Gordon. And uh, on the top right, uh, an example of uh, the buildings of the Barolong or the Botswana, as he, as he called them. Um, just a few things uh, worth notice, noticing here. On the map, you, there's a small detail uh, on one bend of the Orange River. Uh, and you can read uh, Vegdan, uh, Vegna de Moichanas. He was able to pin down on the map where a route or a road from the Orange River started and um, you know, went to the north. Um, this allows us to elaborate on the existence of trading communities um, on this frontier, uh, of this river frontier. Uh, that um, where you know the trade that uh, Gordon described was taking place, trade in iron from uh, and metals from the north, cattle from the south, uh, somehow glass beads possibly across the Kalahari. Uh, so we are talking about long distance trade, and this is just um, in a brief, I mean, a, an outline I've made, uh, putting together the evidence and the more hypothetical trade routes. Um, those dots, uh, I mean, the, the, the arrows, the dotted arrows are those uh, about which I don't have strong evidence. Uh, and this is based uh, on several published research, uh, I mean, several published literature and uh, new research done by me. But uh, so there is evidence of uh, trade routes crossing the Kalahari and going north. And uh, what is uh, lacking is the evidence of a trade route connecting the land of Tau or the Barolong uh, to the Lagoa in, uh, in the east. Um, of course, one issue when we discuss um, trade is uh, you know, distance and, and time. And this just for example, to give an example, uh, in the case of Robert Yavo Gordon, who traveled to the, to the frontier of this, uh, of this kingdom, um, of course, not necessarily the fastest uh, pace and uh, the, you know, the, the straightest route, but it, it took some time to, uh, to get from Cape Town to uh, the land of Tau or to the very border of the land of Tau uh, in the 18th century. Um, and this, I mean, this basically the, the lack of, of, of proper evidence um, and of, well, of a written description and of uh, recent archaeological works on, on the land of the Barlong. Uh, and my frustration with these uh, difficulties led me to explore a, a hint that I found uh, a few years ago while working on this subject. And it's the uh, occurrence of a smallpox epidemic in this area uh, in the 18th century. Now, uh, very briefly, uh, smallpox has been a major theme for 18th century uh, history of the Cape Colony. Um, smallpox was a very uh, widespread disease. Um, We're talking about variola major, who had a very high mortality. Uh, these are the main uh, features. Of course, important to, note, to, to know is that by the end of the century, we have the introduction of vaccine by Jenner, well, the discovery of vaccines, but already in the 18th century, variolation as inoculation was uh, spreading uh, across, North, I mean, across Europe was already in use in Africa and the Ottoman Empire though. Um, and this is the most recent piece of research that I've been doing. So um, as I said, um, while epidemics of smallpox have been studied in, in the Cape Colony, um, I've been trying to put them together uh, with the neighboring regions. So as I showed in the first map, uh, Luanda and Mozambique would be my, and the Lagua would be my, you know, places of interest. And um, now I'm reasoning on this apparent uh, correlation, chronological correlations of epidemics uh, taking place in Luanda and in Cape Town uh, in clusters of years that uh, might be uh, revealing of something or some patterns of you know communications 
Uh, Mozambique is absent for the moment from the source that I've uh, consulted, but in the middle you can see um, five years of uh, smallpox epidemics in the land of Barlong with the death of three important men who were uh, the regent and their, the successor to the king. Um, so when, uh, when mentioning that uh, smallpox has been a an important um, theme in, in colonial history. Um, we always look at these three epidemics, 1713, 1755, 1767, with the impact they had on the colonial society and also on the Khoi Khoi and Khoi San population of the neighboring uh, Cape province. Uh, it's always difficult to assess and evaluate the impact on the African population. This has been hugely debated. Um, and it is even more difficult to assess the impact on uh, the Barlong uh, for various reasons. You know, as I said, the lack of written sources, uh, the funeral rites, and, and how uh, scarce burials are in, uh, in this uh, uh, region. So also the difficulty to undertake archaeological research aimed at, uh, you know, um, finding out evidence of epidemics. Um, so we are left with this description coming from the very uh, moment Gordon was on the Orange River, mentioning that smallpox was raging uh, in the north, and then uh, years later, uh, when one of the first um, travelers arrived in the region, uh, mentioning how many people uh, can, I mean, how many people carry the signs of having had smallpox. Um, and now the question that is uh, the crucial one for me is understanding if these epidemics uh, in the Barlong Kingdom uh, arrive from the south as it's, it is always implied and sometimes explicitly mentioned in, in the literature and in the sources or from the north. And this is the group of source, these are the group of sources that I found mentioning explicitly that this epidemic, this smallpox epidemic came from the north. Um, and this is particularly tantalizing because of the lack of, of documents and, and evidence about connections uh, from those parts of Africa, especially the north, the northeast and, and east to the Lagoa. Uh, whereas these kind of sources point out that uh, this might have been the case. And again, even more interestingly, um, together will, or maybe even shortly after the epidemics, the knowledge of inoculation was transmitted from the north uh, and north, northeast. This, of course, uh, come into uh, question the problem of who brought that inoculation. Was that brought by the Portuguese uh, in the Lagoa or Mozambique? And we don't know, and it's uh, at the moment very difficult to, uh, to make an hypothesis. But so drawing to the conclusion, Sorry, I'm going to cut you off because it's... Um... Yeah, this was just the, the last slide. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, this could have been the reason why the, the Barlong kingdom fell, but as always, uh, it was really a, a very bad period for them, as you can see from this slide. So uh, without uh, further evidence, this remains, you know, as an hypothesis. Uh, and yeah, as I said, I welcome all the comments and the questions and the criticism you have. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. All right, so thank you everybody and especially to Bronwyn for organizing this wonderful conference. I'd like to begin my presentation today by explaining how I came to my study of 18th century Gold Coast by way primarily of my interest in the 19th century. That is specifically colonial rule and practices of colonial statecraft. I do not want to dwell on 19th century too long, but let me start sharing my screen. So here we go. Let's see if you can see that. Okay. So this is, this is um, over here pointing to the area of the Gold Coast. So what's present day Southern Ghana, and this is excluding the Asante Kingdom um, in the interior of the country. And just the only thing I want to note before talking about this area in the 18th century is that the Gold Coast formed a somewhat unusual story when it comes to colonialism in Africa, because unlike in most other places, the colonial state was not a dispossessing force in the southern Gold Coast. 
as most of us in this call probably know, empires tended to dispossess African people in many ways, whether through wars of conquest, dispossession through purchase, like the island of Lagos, um, and centrally, usually through the arguments that because the land was the private property of nobody, it was wasteland or what Europeans called terra nullius, that the land could be put to better use by European governments who would divide it up, commercialize it, and develop it through private competition. These are, for example, the legal claims that the British used to seize land elsewhere, such as in colonial Kenya, South Africa, and the Americas and Australia. The British tried to do this in the Gold Coast as well, but in this situation, they were barred from proceeding. UK Parliament and the Queen got involved and said, actually, we've reviewed the evidence and clearly all land in the Gold Coast, every square yard is private property. This is the private property of the people. The colonial state has no claim here. And so for the rest of colonial rule in Ghana, the colonial government would have to manufacture a state without owning the land. They would have to rent, they would have to purchase. They began from a place of total austerity. Um, and when I began my dissertation research, I thought this was remarkable. I thought this totally set the Gold Coast apart as a study. And so um, a few years ago, I was having a conversation with Gareth Austin when I was at the University of Cambridge. And I asked him how he thought this could have taken place. And, and, and very interestingly, he said that he didn't think it had anything to do with the land or how the land was owned, but that this was a testimony to the activism by Gold Coast politicians at the time who had managed to rally support for their cause. And, and I do think it's true that to an extent, Gold Coast activists were extraordinarily organized, but that didn't strike me and it still doesn't strike me as a sufficient explanation. Because among the other things that were remarkable about the Gold Coast at this time period, colonial state builders, when they entered this territory in the late 19th century, so around the 1870s, 1880s, they produced a number of documents and reports detailing how amazingly sophisticated Gold Coast land ownership was. There are reports that just say, every square yard of land has its owner. Though no boundaries may be visible to the European, they are perfectly clear to the eyes of the various owners. Without a doubt, every piece of land, every yard, every inch has its proper owner. This was the vernacular that amazed colonial officers from the very beginning. So I decided to take that seriously. Looking back at the 18th century, the century before colonial rule, I wanted to know what relationships with the land were like. And in particular, I wanted to try to think about the prehistory of the colonial encounter or the colonial gaze that would emerge in the 19th century, which interpreted private property through a number of very symbolic technologies. For example, it was very important to the British that the Gold Coast people had fences, which often cordoned their houses and farmland. Gold Coast people were very attentive to their boundaries and they, they knew where their boundaries were. This was a world, as one colonial officer insisted, of thousands of internal borders. So in this presentation, I just wanna outline three brief observations, which lays the groundwork for the chapter of my book manuscript that I circulated and which is the basis for my study on colonialism. The first observation has to do with the spatial configuration of Gold Coast settlements in the 18th century and ways of thinking about commonalities and spatial layouts that led to a world of borders. Like in many parts of the world, Gold Coast settlements tended to have natural borders affixed to features like rivers and rocks. These would form the outer perimeter of the settlements where importantly gods resided and where people would pay regular tribute in exchange for safety and fortune. In this way, the safety of the settlement often depended on the protection offered by the border gods, a feature that we can imagine was especially important during the very regular warfare of the Atlantic slave trade. So this is a drawing um, made in the 17th century of the Fetu god Kuku, who inhabited the Kuku River off the town of present day Cape Coast. And Kuku was capable, even though belonging to the river, 
of materializing in many different parts of the town. So this is a picture of him materializing in the marketplace slash meeting place that was in the center of Cape Coast. Gold Coast settlements tended to have main marketplaces like this. In a country, this was called the Ashiaye. Chia meaning to meet and ye meaning place, so meeting place. And all citizens arriving at the market in the 17th and 18th centuries would have had to leave their weapons outside the market. So oftentimes there was a ring of weapons encircling the entry to the marketplace. Other spatial sensibilities bonding Gold Coast sediments included a sacred rock located on the shore, a sacred tree that stood in the center of the marketplace. And you can see that in this drawing here behind Kuku. Um, and this place was meant precisely for communing with spirits and offering tribute. The distribution of these place gods, um, which in Akan are called the Abosom and in Ga the Wudzi, created their own spatial logic and a common way of understanding the town center vis-a-vis -vis the borders. Very importantly, border gods were connected the town center to the borderlands because they could materialize in places like the Ashiaye. So branching from this spatial understanding, I suggest in my work that fences in the Gold Coast were the materialization of another form of sacred border. I, I don't know when fences first emerged in the Gold Coast. This is an engraving um, produced in 1602 of, of, of coastal Gold Coast. So um, Europeans suggest that fences were there from the very beginning. And certainly some of the archeological studies that we have by people like Jacques Chouin and Christopher de Course have talked about the long history of earthworks in the area of Ghana. And I would say the fences have generally been interpreted for defensive reasons, like other walled towns that we know of in West Africa. But what a reading of European sources and Gold Coast oral traditions shows me, at least, is that fences were also seen as sacred barriers that depended on blessings by the gods. Many European records reflect on the fact that offerings and tribute would be placed outside the fences or gates for the gods. Spirits were said to wander through the streets and up to the fences at night to receive this tribute. And spiritual amulets were often strung on the fences or in the cases of some European forts built directly into their walls or foundations. This is an engraving of the Fort at Almina where I haven't found any evidence that amulets were engraved into the walls probably because the fort was so early but I have seen records like this for the European fort at Dick's Cove where amulets and um, ritual consecrations were put into the walls surrounding the fort. And a number of different Ghana Khan terms proliferate regarding fences. The Akrabatsa, for example, was a sacred fence that enclosed a shrine. The Pampi or Pampim was a low fence or gate that stood on the outside of Ga or a town towns warding evil spirits away. And this is a shared word between the two languages, which gestures that the technology was probably, probably spread some time after the 16th century. And the point I emphasize here is that enclosing farmland or houses was not necessarily about marking out property or even about posing defense. It was also about spiritually coordinating an area, a practice that I call enshrining. It marked to the gods what needed to be protected, something that Europeans later did not understand. And my last point um, that I wanna close with is that I, even then, I believe that there is considerable evidence that land sale and leasing did come into effect before colonial rule in the 19th century. And this can also be seen in the metamorphosis of spiritual rights and practices. Before, because of slave trade related wars, immigration to the Southern Gold Coast continued apace through the 17th and 19th centuries with refugees flooding from the East and from the North around the Asante territories radically increasing population density. When immigrants came in, they confronted a world of fences and of borders. One where perhaps even surprisingly to them, commons like the rivers and lagoons, which were the homes of the gods, were considered basically the private collective property of the people who pay tribute to that deity. Immigrants had to pay tithes for everything. They would pay rent on the land that they settled on, but also fees for the use of particular roads, forest, water all of which were the domains of gods who had particular relationships to people they settled. And this is probably what looked like to Europeans, a highly privatized world. And lastly, in terms of land sale, 
Europeans noted a great number of terms for land sale. The most important to me is the term yiba fonga, which in a Khan translate into the practice of fuiba, which is an amorgan of vibafo. But as Nikon lawyer J.B. Danqua noted, Fuiba was a ritual that involved slaughtering a sheep on the ground and cutting leaf over the um, piece of land that was sold, therefore signaling permanent alienation. And in the 18th century, that was the same practice that governed the sale of an enslaved person from one's community. The same practice of slaughtering a sheep and cutting leaf over the enslaved person's head. So the same ritual practices that mediated selling an enslaved person from a community mediated the practice of selling land, probably because it meant permanently alienating the relationships between that community and the God. So um, I'm gonna stop there, but, but the sum point is to say that I think that in, when it comes to my work and thinking about land and power relations in the Gold Coast, I'm not just trying to create a pre-colonial chapter that sets the conditions for the colonial state, but to more provocatively show how the relationships between people and land in the Gold Coast was sort of the major force shaping the movement of history. And that when the colonial state came in, they had to mold themselves according to these relationships. They couldn't radically change them and alienate the land in, that, in the way that they wanted. And that these relationships of possess, and possession and protection would also, as I show, come to shape the rise of anti-colonialism. Great, thanks everybody. Um, if, you, if the speakers could all um, turn your cameras back on. Um, and we can have like two minutes of speakers speaking to each other, if you'd like. Um, I I know that these papers seem really disparate, but I but I what I think is really interesting about them, despite being all representing different parts of um, of Africa, um, is the sort of um, questions of environmental determinism versus environmental dynamism that I think that they raise, um, and um and the the contrast that they give to a lot of the 19th century idea of sort of like battling the environment um i think i think possibly you guys yours is closest to to getting to that kind of um approach um and possibly just because of the longevity of, of portuguese um settlement in angola but um but i think looking at the 18th century gives a slightly different kind of view of how um, how people are engaging with the environment. So um, do you guys have any questions for each other? Can I, can I kick off an architectural question? Um, I have, I have much, I declare an interest because um, I was, I've uh, been much involved in the Edward Jenner Museum in England um, and have done quite a bit of work on variolation and vaccination. And one of the things that came to light, particularly looking at the spread of smallpox in the first fleet in Australia, is that the first fleet stopped off in Cape Town on its the When it arrived, the Aborigines all started drying of smallpox. And the, the standard colonial narrative is that it spread over land um, from the north through Indonesian sea co cucumber fisher, fishermen. But actually, the variolation is involved in carrying live small possibility. Actually, live small pox is being trade goods and so forth. And I wonder whether one of the reasons why smallpox is spreading in Southern Africa is because there is live smallpox which is being used for variolation rather so contemporary with COVID um, is actually getting out of the surgeon's chest and um, is spreading more widely from there, from that mechanism. Uh, Ronan, shall I reply to that? Okay, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, no, I didn't know the story, the history of the, you know, the fleet in Australia, uh, but I did read about, you know, how the, you know, inoculation was highly debated in the 18th century. Some doctors were, you know, supporting it as a, as a means of, of fighting against smallpox, and others were actually saying, but you actually spread smallpox with variolation and, and inoculation. So. Um, 
Uh, the point is, I, I don't, I, of course, I don't have a, you know, a, a sure answer to your question. Um, I think it's it's interesting the fact that they were sharing the, this bit of medical knowledge uh, along those those who probably were trading goods. Um, in the sources, I have the feeling that the idea of violation comes after a series of epidemics are already have already hit uh, South Africa. Um, and when it comes, I mean, when, when we look at the epidemics coming through Cape Town, I haven't heard about variolation and inoculation in the Dutch settlement. Uh, of course, I need to do more research, uh, but I would suppose that Dutch settlers and, and Dutch officials at the beginning of the 18th century weren't much in favor of inoculation. But that's supposition for for the moment. Um, I hope it it answers at least partially. Tim, did you want to ask yours about the Orange River? Uh, if I can get organized, there we go. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, they were all uh, terrific papers. Really enjoyed them. But I had a question for Atari. Um, how, how much uh, evidence do you have, or you've uncovered about? Uh, uh, River and trade on the Orange River, and uh, and following that thought, um, since I believe the Orange River goes east and west, mm -hmm. and it, smallpox potentially could have gone on via boat. Mm -hmm. How does that uh, influence or reflect in your work on the the North South uh, idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Tim. Um, and I think so. I think Nursi's question about the smallpox and Swana might be relevant. Kenosi, do you want to come in or do you want me to read it? Oh, oh yes, I just want to come in. <laughs> yes, I just want to know uh, a little bit of the, uh, maybe the, uh, like here, uh, every disease has got a, its own interpretation and really the cause of it. So I just want to know if you already come out with a uh, really find out maybe the indigenous interpretation of the cause of the smallpox and also how maybe the, the local medicine man will try to cure the 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 the, the, uh, the, the smallpox yeah thanks can i see so well answering both questions together brown is that right um well there there is evidence of of trade along the orange river uh coming from robert jacob gordon jacob vicar another explorer mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's very patchy during the first half of the 18th century, but when you you get to that two three years in the 70, 1770s, those travel accounts are you know a treasure trove of, of information about trade, and you have the feeling that you know people were coming from across the Kalahari. Uh, mm -hmm. The point is, um, yeah, the Orange River was definitely a route you could travel in a very arid environment. Um, and that's why basically I think the route was going northwards along the coast and then uh, eastward into South Africa following mm -hmm. the river. Uh, the southern, the so-called Southern Eiffel, so between the Fowl River and the Orange River, what is today so the, the Orange Free State, uh, was virtually unknown until the 18, mid 1820s, 1830s. Okay. So we, we have no idea, I mean, as far as descriptions go of travel accounts as, as of trade, but we do know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, but you know, you, you understand that people were coming, when you, when you look at the Eastern Cape, but people were coming from the North. So there were interactions with the interior and they knew that, you know, different people speaking Setswana or different languages lived in the interior. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have no evidence of smallpox in the Southern Eiffel. So that would be, you know, the Orange Free State Lesotho area uh, mm -hmm. for that reason. And, and yeah, and maybe uh, then answering to, to Kenozi. Um, well, I must say, all the sources that I've been working on at the moment are, uh, well, colonial sources. And they always assume that the smallpox comes from uh, the Europeans. So they, uh, most of them aren't really interested in, uh, you know, in, uh, in the, like the, the African explanation of smallpox. They simply bypass the African element and they, they are looking for, you know, either Cape Town or, you know, Mozambique, where are the Portuguese, you know, that's where smallpox or inoculation come. But then when it's, what's, what is interesting, uh, you know, separately, um, I mean, for, for my own research, 
I've been working on um, the concept of cutting and you know to cut and to you know to create scars in in one's body, and I've been thinking and thinking about possible overlappings between these two concepts in Sesotho and Setswana. Um, so things that, and I, and I mean, I have nothing to, to propose at the moment, so that would be really uh, highly hypothetical, uh, but I'm sure that it, it had, a, you know, an explanation and um, it, it might not have been, you know, what we call inoculation and variolation might have been a practice that extended beyond the the, the disease itself. Uh, that might have been, you know, some a medical practice that was performed for other reasons, not only for for smallpox. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell or it sounds completely outlandish. Yeah, just also really to follow up a little bit uh, on the question was. Uh, during your uh, your presentation, you studied much more like the people from Luanda as far. I don't know whether is there any uh, maybe uh, uh, is there any uh, any form of smallpox around around Zona Spiki country uh, 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 ethnic groups such as but 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 being or something like that. And also, have you really tried to trace it as far as because they've they've moved up as far as Matiluja next to Francistan as far as as Maui. I don't know whether they've really explored explore those areas or just we just like just in the in the the down area. Well, no, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think the Battle of Ping were affected by smallpox, uh, definitely, as part of the Barong State Kingdom Confederation. Um, and I know that, I mean, the Barlong in the oral histories they mentioned, they traveled as far as uh, Namibia, they fought and traded with the Overero in Namibia. Um, and I don't have, ex like, I don't have actually any evidence uh, of a direct connection between the Barlong and uh, the people of Angola. So that's something I totally, you know, in the, you know, in the dark. Um, but thank you for your questions. That's definitely the direction I'm trying to, um, you know, to understand better. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a few for um, Sarah relating to different um, different influences on property regimes. Um, so, um, Tim, do you want to ask yours quickly, and then and then Paul? Yeah. Hi, Sarah. I uh, really enjoyed your paper. Um, I had a question about the, the influence of Islam, uh, what, the Akan, for example, uh, trading with uh, Mende and Hausa are going to bring uh, property declinations. Uh, and I wonder if you had any uh, thoughts on that. It's a great question, one that I don't unfortunately know as much about. Um, because I work on the, the Southern Gold Coast below right. Asante, there isn't as much evidence sure. about Islamic contact. Um, mm -hmm. and certainly, it would have been useful had there been more Arabic documentation in the South, but there isn't really. Um, and I think I think maybe one of the most productive, um, it, you know, kind of discussions I did have while I was at Cambridge was with Gareth Austin on the difference between land and Asante and the South Gold Coast. You know, he um, wrote a wonderful book on land in Ghana and. Um, it really seemed very different than the kind of formations I was talking about. He, it really seems that because the Asante Empire was more centralized, there really was um, less effort to sort of individually cordon off property and a lot more, I think, public security um, afforded by Asante that made mm -hmm. a lot of the, the kind of ritual gatings for safety's sake um, just less prominent than in the Southern Gold Coast where it is not large kingdoms, very small kingdoms, right. suffering a lot of physical insecurity and where those gating practices, I think because of their ritual significance just held a lot more purchase. And because immigration was really coming south rather than into Asante, the immigrant yeah. problem allowed for just a lot more different types of tithes and fees attached to immigrants. Right. So I think, I think I think the way I'm thinking about it is that it's quite different from a lot of the other formations that we've seen. Um, but yeah, it was a great question. And I okay. think <laughs> thanks, thanks, I really enjoyed the paper. Yeah. 
Hey, Sarah, that was a really interesting paper. And for those of you who haven't read, read her paper itself, it's super interesting. Like, I just very, very exciting. Um, one of the things that I, I mean, I'm, I'm prejudiced about the Gold Coast, but I, I find just the ways that there's so much constant change. And so um, what you have, you can't just find, identify something in the 19th century and then drill, drill back to this, this was how it was before. And so that's my question is with, um, you know, I know about ancestors as, as landholders. And I know that that is a, um, an important deal uh, in the 19th century and later and, um, and, and moving even into the 20th century, but um, ancestors were not present really um, it, as, as uh, under your focus here. And I was wondering if um, that's just what you're working on or, or whether you find that the ancestors are not showing up as important creatures in, in, in land. That's such an interesting question. Um, truly interesting. You know, it's funny, this morning I presented at a different conference at like 8 a.m. because it was Berlin time. And it was about cemeteries. Um, it was an urban ownership conference, but I was arguing that the reason why the colonial state um, militantly enforces cemetery burial in the southern Gold Coast is because they don't own the land and Gold Coast people will not sell their property, the British, to the contains the remains of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So you need to centralize the ancestral remains inside public cemeteries in order to make land private fungible property in the way that the colonial state wanted it. So I have been thinking about ancestors all day, actually. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting. I think that the way in the pre-colonial sources, I was also surprised the ancestors did not figure as the paramount owners so much as the deities. Um, and that tribute being paid for rent was really tribute being paid to deities. Um, and ancestors, interestingly, you know, I think I think the major ancestors were what the Akan called the Ejabosam. So these are um, Ejai's father and Bosam is deity. So literally translates as father's deities. And their shrines would be inside the house, inside the compound. And you would pay tribute to the Eja Bosom. I think one interesting thing about just how much war affected the Southern Gold Coast, perhaps more than Asante, is that people's houses were ransacked all the time. And I have a lot mm. of records of how people would try and take the Eja Bosom with them. They would bury them in places and try to come back for them. And um, basically there was a kind of a constant disruption to the ways in which the ancestors created protection. And I don't know if that's necessarily an explanation as to why the land deities um, are more important than ancestors at that time in terms of mediating land sale and land rent. But I think it does affect it, like the instability of the house and the household possessions and the household shrines is certainly a factor. And I think the other thing is that when immigration is more fresh, the deities who allowed you to settle in that land are very, very important. Um, and then sort of later, the first ancestors who are the ones who entreated with the deities become pretty much as important as those deities. But I don't think that at a time of fresh immigration, that's the case. So when we think about the 18th or 17th century, I mean, people would have moved maybe within that hundred years or maybe just slightly earlier. And so the deities of the, the lagoons and the forests and stuff, I think are the most important and therefore become the owners of the land. Um, but that's a really good question because especially, yeah, right, like in the 19th and 20th century, I mean, people really talk about in terms of ancestors, though not as much after cemeteries. <laughs> that's, cemeteries that's, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, that is the constant change there, All right? Thank you. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. But um, thank you everybody. Um, and um, a big um, virtual round of applause. Um, and um, we will move swiftly on um, to our panel on memory, um, starting with Anne Hauer. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for all the papers. Um, here is mine. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. And I'm aware we only have 10 minutes. And I want to first of all say that this is very much a collaborative paper. Um, it's co-authored with a number of people and at least one of them is in the audience. So I'm delighted um, about that. So our 
work relates to a part of West Africa that uh, currently lies totally outside of any of the 18th century sources. Very little was known about it. And we're right at the northernmost part of the Republic of Benin and along the Niger River. And between 2011 and 2015, uh, a large team of us were working in that area funded by the European Research Council. So as I mentioned, we have very few or no historical sources for the area. And what we do have is very contradictory. You've got a complete paradox insofar as the area is hazily described as quite important and full of these medieval empires and trade connections in the medieval period. And then by the time the Europeans have direct experience of it, it is seen as quite a no man's land, quite dangerous and remote. Now, the fact that the record is patchy and contradictory is of course an issue that is shared with many other regions of the world. So we felt that uh, what we learned from this might be applicable to other areas. And what we did was essentially deploy a whole set of different methods linking archeology, span ethnography, architecture, and I can't cover the whole thing. I did want to say that uh, in the company of historians, I, I do want to clarify that we normally also do painstaking work on very detailed bits of data. And, you know, we individually examine 42,000 pot shirts. But today, um, tonight, we're just going for the big ideas and the rather speculative things, trying to think about what was happening in Dindi in the 18th century. So that was just by way of caveat. So we worked as a team over a period of five years. And over that time, in a combination of oral and archeological data, we tried to find not just traces of regionally significant exports, such as jasper, horses, cotton, textiles, um, or unfortunately enslaved people, but also to track the transmission of cultural practices and knowledge, um, that is to say technical know-how. So in our inquiries with present day informants, we covered traditions of migration, links to past political entities, the role of specialist craftspeople such as potters and blacksmiths. So between 2011 and 2013, we carried that kind of ethnographic work out and also archeological work with extensive surveys across the area, which is about hundred kilometers by 30. We excavated small test bits to evaluate the stratigraphic depth at some sites, and we undertook more extensive excavations at some places. The picture on the middle here is, is one of them. And we identified several hundred sites, among which an impressive series of large settlement mounds, which dotted the whole valley. By 2014, our fourth field season, it became clear that we needed to make some adjustments. Uh, these large settlement mounds, impressive and informative as they may be, were all medieval and apparently abandoned around the 14th century. On the side of the ethnographic inquiries, the historical narrative only really went back into the middle of the 19th century. So we were a tiny bit stuck for a project that had intended to bridge ethnographic and archeological data and approaches, we found ourselves with this temporal gap, which we needed to explain and hopefully fail. So to that end, in the penultimate year of field work, uh, we decided to undertake a series of surveys and test fits in present day towns and villages. And that work was led by Ali Livingston Smith, who's uh, with us today. And, this involved combining inquiries in the ground with the analysis of satellite imagery. And it was our informants who told us where the test pits should go. They pointed us to the earliest part of a village and they were profoundly interested in the local history and keen to know more about it through archeological means. And we also investigated some settlements which are long abandoned. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the remainder and the next slide. I have to say also that we made another important adjustment, which was on the ethnographic side, in terms of which crafts we studied. So initially the focus had been on pottery, but actually as it turned out, potting pretty much had died out in the region. But two other crafts, which really hadn't been on our radar at the beginning, emerged as being of utmost importance to our informants in Dendi. 
that is weaving and dyeing. And this is important because these turned out to be of major significance in tracking past connections across the wider area. That's explained in more detail in, in our written paper and the references therein. But I want to just introduce you to, to some of the sites that um, abandoned sites, which became quite interesting. And these are places that nobody really has published or had heard about. So it isn't anything that we knew about before we started our sustained engagement with the landscape of Dendi. And these groups are considered significant by historically minded people in Dendi. And it was a way for us to really look at the heritage from the soil up to listen to what people were saying about what was important in terms of past um, history. So these sites often related to networks of communities in a radius of tens, sometimes hundreds of kilometers. And again, most were unknown outside the region with some extra exceptions. Um, the three I'd like to just briefly run through today are Toruwe, Katanga, and Norubangu. Toruwe uh, was identified um, as an ancient village near the river Niger, and people told us it was a major port which um, owed its existence to specialist boatmen who had extremely large canoes and were able to convey across the river caravans, um, including, you know, of course, people, animals, and their goods. And um, this technology gave them supremacy over the local fishermen who had much smaller boats and enabled them to make a very tidy profit from um, trade crossing the area. Katanga, on the other side of the river, today in the Republic of Niger, was mentioned in 14 villages, and most people presented it as a place that was originally inhabited by uh, Yoruba communities who were rich, um, engaged in trade, and operated Norubangu, the carry shell pond. Uh, the relevance of the Yoruba is um, surprising here because this is a community which presently is more associated with regions far to the southeast in Nigeria, so several hundred kilometers away. And I'll get back to the Yoruba. Um, Norubangu, that is the carry pond or money pond, uh, is the place that is widely held to have made the wealth of those who controlled it, thanks to a sacrifice which allowed people to collect carry shells from this expanse of the river Niger. And the description of the process by which carries were collected is surprising in the level of technical detail. Now, I probably, but I, I will point out that carry shells do not occur in fresh water. Um, this is a story that is clearly using carries as a metaphor for something else. And we became very interested in this because the accounts also agree on the need for human sacrifice. And over the sub sub uh, successive field seasons, people became more and more willing to grudgingly admit that this area had been uh, a transit zone for um, people enslaved farther north and headed to the Atlantic coast. So in the 19th century, your, your classic story of West Africa, Dundee, like many other areas, becomes one of those competition grounds between British, German, and French uh, sources. And at that time, however, Dundee appears to, their, to them remote and wild. And this not until the late 19th century that you get the first hand account by a European observer. Um, Heinrich Barth, who traveled across West Africa in 1853, avoided Dendi because of insecurity. But he was told that a few years earlier, there had been a major route crossing the area and it continued all the way into what is now Ghana. And this we think provides strong support to the locally held traditions which suggests that Dendi was bisected by a caravan route of primary importance in the first decades of the 19th century and in the 18th century. And this we think crossed the river near Katanga and Toruwe. So by the time Heinrich Barth wrote, those places had ceased to be important. Um, the whole story of this area becomes quite um, insecure and, and warlike in the 19th century when local resistance to the Fulani Jihad throws the region into a state of war that lasted and remained near permanent until the end of the 19th century. Trade routes veered 
to the north and southeast, bypassing Dendi entirely. And this is a situation that the Europeans encountered when they first arrived in the region. So we think that um, these accounts of the first Europeans, combined with the lack of interest for the history of local populations, contributed to erasing the prominent economic role played by Dendi in the 18th century and before. And in fact, if you look at it, there has been um, extensive work on the link between caravan routes and uh, family names. And we know that the Dendi language was and still is spoken in trade settlements um, in the south of Benin and even into Ghana. So all of this suggests to us the involvement of Dendi merchants along those roads prior to the development of later networks. And we think that the communities associated with the sites of Katanga, Norubangu, and Torue were the main operating agents of these spheres. Now, again, these are not sites that anybody really had heard of outside the immediate area. And if you look at this really lovely 1722 map, there is no mention of any place in Dendi. And it does, like, it does look like it was not significant enough to attract international notice. People were getting their information from the Atlantic coastline and from North Africa at this stage. So in comparison to regions to the east, and in particular the Hausa cities, which are very clearly identified on this map, Dendi is really invisible. So we do think that despite the importance of this trade route, it was a minor player in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was probably weak in demographic and economic terms, but there was a major crossing point on the Niger River, probably associated with mar marketplaces on either side of the river. All of this in a really restricted area and nothing um, of the scale of what was happening to the south or to the east. And we also think that in the late 18th century, this area was reintegrated by some new actors who were economic entrepreneurs coming from farther north, uh, following the idea of the frontier areas pioneered by Igor Kopitov. All of this 17th, 18th century activity, we think, was gradually forgotten because of the 19th century wars that devastated the region and caused the collapse of former trade routes. So the story here, this is my final slide. For us, um, it, it was really interesting that our research plan had been informed by the sources that we had access to, which were in the published record. And then once we based ourselves in Dendi, we started conversing with local history holders and a whole set of new sites and new ideas and new crafts came to prominence and brought, brought to our attention indicate to us that this region was actually once widely connected, probably largely through the trade um, in enslaved people and heading all the way down to the Atlantic shoreline. We'll hear more about the Yoruba, for instance, tomorrow, but the, the link through this site of Katanga and Norubangu and the various traditions surrounding the use of the carry pond do strongly suggest uh, the exploitation of, of humans as an economic commodity. So in conclusion, uh, it seems to us that locally held knowledge preserves some evidence of the situation in the 18th century. And our comparative analysis of the traditions held in a string of villages along the Niger River, combined with archaeological approaches to building historical narratives, and there's a lot of excellent scholarship here, um, has brought to light some really crucial aspects of the 18th century, which otherwise lie forgotten. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Um, and now up is uh, Daniel. All right, let me just uh, share my screen quickly. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Daniele or, or Daniel for short, um, and um, I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you to, to everyone for organizing this conference, particularly Bronwyn and Judith, um, and, uh, and thank you for the, the wonderful papers that 
have taken place over the past couple of weeks. Um, I'll be focusing on literature today uh, and in particular kind of genres of life writing, autobiography and, and the memoir, uh, to use a term that, that echoes the title of this particular panel. Uh, the title of my paper is Thus I Came By My Name, A History of 18th Century African Life Writing Through Grotier Furrow's Narrative of 1789. So born in the late 18th century, approximately around 1729 in modern day Ghana, Grotier Furrow published his life story in 1789 creating one of the earliest examples of print life writing from an Africa born in West Africa. Across his life, Fura was abducted many times, and in the process of being enslaved, he was forced to move to Barbados and then to Rhode Island in what is now the United States, where he was coerced into changing his name to Venture Smith. In the last years of his life, he committed this story to print and published a narrative of the life and ventures of Venture, a native of Africa, related by himself. Um, and you can see the facts and of that on, on your screens. The very title of the work places his Africanness at the forefront of his identity and his life writing. Yet the use of the name imposed upon him by white colonialists signals the way in which his existential freedoms as a writer and as an individual were often limited. This paper will examine how Furo explores his individual, familial, cultural, and continental identities through literature. Of particular interest is the way in which the text, divided into sections preceding and following his forced transatlantic movement, shifts from expressing a localized identity based around his birthplace in Dukandara, um, uh, in, in uh, West Africa, referring to the general area as, as Guinea, to a pan-continental reframe as an African person. It is, it is his forced separation from the continent that emphasizes his sense of self as belonging to or originating from Africa or West Africa in particular. This paper also seeks to draw attention to the auto-ethnographic elements of his narrative, including the detailed observations of the coast of Guinea. His text presents brilliant, meticulous accounts of the history and the culture of West Africa by a West African writer. It's important here to consider the ways in which Furo reclaims agency in contrast to the colonialist travel writing about Africa published coterminously. This paper therefore attempts to understand his work in conjunction with theories such as that of counter travel um, coined by Holland and Huggen in 1998 to, in order to analyze how 18th century Africa was represented textually. While James O. Horton has explored the ways in which, quote, the story of Venture Smith is an important part of American history, and this is perhaps indeed the case, I would add that the story of Grotier Furo is also an important part of West African history and the wider history of the world from the 18th century onwards. Um, so to give a sense of the, the kinds of ways in which he's framing his life writing, um, the narrative proper begins unequivocally with the first person pro, through which Furo asserts its identity according to the conventions of autobiographic writing. As such, the text helps to commence the tradition of West African and African American life writing in print. And it begins with Furo's self defined introduction, which you can see on your screen I was born in Dukandara in Guinea about the year 1729. My father's name was Sam Furo, Prince of the Tribe of Dukandara. The agency here is placed squarely on the author's perspective and his personal experiences, making it clear to the reader that this is the voice of Furo as an individual committed to text. Noticeably conspicuous by its absence in the opening, however, is his name, uh, is his name any version of it. Sentences later instead Furo notes how his parents gave him his name using the third person. And I think that the delayed relaying of this information presents a slight omission which foreshadows his forced name change later in life. While this, to a certain, a certain extent, speaks to the doubleness within every act of autobiographic, um, autobiographic writing, the other historical being 
of the living writing self. Uh, it also reveals the specific conditions based on his transnational and transatlantic life and the violence which British colonialism and transatlantic trans enslavement uh, imposed on his identity. One of the things that I'm attempting to do elsewhere in my paper and to give uh, an introductory sense of it is the way in which um, uh, Furo divides his identity between that which is localized entirely to his sense of belonging to Dukandara, to an identity that gives a sense of belonging to the African continent as a whole. Interestingly, this sense of identity change happens on the cusp between chapters one and chapter two, as I already said. Um, this is uh, a dividing point, point in the text um, uh, during which uh, Furo represents his moment of, of forced migration uh, across the Atlantic. The noun Africa appears only on two pages of the narrative. One of these pages is this very page here between the chapters, which is split halfway um, uh, between the ending of one, the commencement of the other. Within it, he describes having been forced to sail from the coast of Africa to Barbados, and that in the middle passage from Africa, 60 enslaved people have died. Thoreau does not use the word Africa again um, elsewhere in his text. And he only uses the adjective African once more at the end of the work, uh, an example to which I will um, hopefully return to. The structural split, therefore, of the page into two halves on the limen between chapter one and chapter two, the limen between Dukandara, the Atlantic, and the Americas, gives a sense of how the notion of Africa as a place and a place of identification emerges here through the liminal experience and the violence of the Middle Passage. Um, elsewhere in my research, I'm thinking about the ways in which Furo's writing offers a powerful instance of counter travel, um, which, according to Holland and, and Huggen, as you can see on the screens, is a way for writers to locate themselves in opposition to conventional modes of travel. I won't have too much time to offer uh, many examples, but throughout his work, he gives uh, these beautiful representations of life within Dukadara, and he uses again the first person um, I in order to signal the differences between the kinds of travel that he performed early on in his life versus the forced migration later on in his life. Um, he talks about uh, various social conventions including polygamy, uh, which as I, and I, uh, ex as I expand upon in my paper is represented without any of the kind of moralizing language that we see within colonialist writing of the same period. Similarly, I'm also interested in thinking about the ways in which he repeats the term rich to counteract the kinds of European travel logs which uh, create economic binaries between the so-called global north and the so-called global, uh, global south. Um, and Furo, within his text, constantly uses the word rich in reference to both his family, uh, superior associates with Bukhara versus the immorality that he experiences in America. To this end, um, I will leave with, with one final uh, quotation to unpack. Um, and this is uh, from the very end of the text. Um, it's a, a, a moment uh, in which Furo is representing a false accusation which was levied against him by a white American who attempted to take him to court on false charges. And I'll just read the quotation for you. For it says, such a proceeding as this, the court proceeding, committed on a defenseless stranger, i.e. himself, almost worn out in the hard service of the world, without any foundation in reason or justice, whatever, whatever it may be called in a Christian land, would in my native country have been branded as a crime equal to highway robbery, i.e. the false charges were a crime equal to highway robbery. But Captain Hart was a white gentleman, and I, poor African, therefore it was all right in the eyes of the court. And, and he goes on to, uh, to uh, describe the way in which it was all right, according to the kind of slurs that were being used against him, which I haven't reproduced here um, for, um, for perhaps obvious reasons.
So his language, I think, here creates a series of violence. Christian and non-Christian, America and Furrow's, quote, native country, crime and justice. And these binaries reverse the colonial binaries forged in much Western literature, which dehumanized, which dehumanized and continues to dehumanize so-called, uh, quote, unquote, native um, spaces as the antithesis of positively depicted white Europeans. Furrow upends this racist myth completely. His dualistic language is echoed for me. The depiction of an economically rich Dukandara at the start of the text, which I was alluding to before, is used as the countering mirror to a morally impoverished and a morally corrupt America on the last two pages of his text. In other words, the United States is framed as other in Furrow's life writing. Interestingly, it is the very discourse of white Americans, the discourse which is quoted in italics, um, which is employed to create violence and prejudice, including the slur that I haven't quoted here. It is through discourse, or at least beginning with it, that white Americans construct the racist, uh, the racist binary categories of, quote, rich white gentleman and, quote, poor African. So the racist and capitalist violence at work there. Um, just to conclude uh, and sum up uh, very quickly, um, I think that in this section of the narrative and other sections, there's an interesting uh, attention to the links between culture or discourse and imperialism, which anticipates much of post-colonial theory that was uh, emerging in the 20th century onwards. For his work reminds modern readers today of how this relationship happened, relationship between culture and tourism, and how it was recognized in the 18th century. It is to say the very least that Furo's work represents one of the most important pieces of life writing of this time period, if not of all time. His writing explores nuanced questions of how regional, continental and national identities are being formed, and it reverses the colonial gaze to offer new authentic insights into how Dukandara and neighboring parts of West Africa were represented in print. This both reclaims agency over the Anglophone first person narrative to actively resist European and American colonialism and racism, and to self-represent the history and geography of the, ancestor, of the author's ancestral home. Um, in some ways, I think Furrow's nu nuanced unpacking the categories of identity resonate with some of Paul Gilroy's conceptualizing, including that in the Black Atlantic, uh, in which Gilroy suggests, uh, uh, Gilroy describes a desire to, tra to transcend both the structure of the nation state and the constraints of ethnicity and national particularity. And I think Furrow is doing this in relation to American national nationalism mm -hmm. and his identity mm -hmm. um, in relation to Duke and um, I'll leave it there um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And now um, next up is Antonia. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. Thank you very much, everybody, for all of your fantastic papers. It's really, really exciting to be able to share my paper with you as this will be um, introducing my research for a PhD starting at University College London in September and it is titled The Grand Detour. James Bruce as an agent of Ethiopian antiquarianism. So in Oxford's Bodleian Library there is an Ethiopian manuscript that has the potential to overturn commonly held conceptions of the Grand Tour, placing Africa and African rulers firmly in the picture. When you open the manuscript, you come across the following words, handwritten in cursive script across one of the first photo pages. And it reads from Ras Michael, governor of the province of Tigray in Abyssinia. Abyssinia is the historical term for the Ethiopian Empire, which is located in modern day Eritrea and Ethiopia. It was Christian before Constantinople. The donor of this manuscript, Ras Michael Sahul, 
was the powerful governor of Tigray, and since 1768, the Endras, or regent of the empire. His surname, the Astute, was a moniker that was very expressive of his character. Known as a Machiavellian kingmaker, he was effectively regent to a string of kings over a quarter of a century at the cusp of, era, of Ethiopia's era of the princes. We see a portrait of the Ethiopian nobleman presented as a victorious classical emperor. An image of his profile and also of the laurel wreath adorns two sides of a coin inscribed in Latin. The manuscript is a copy of the Kebra Nagast, a 14th century national Ethiopian saga that details how Ethiopia's first emperor, Menelik I, was born from an encounter between the biblical queen of Sheba and King Solomon in Judea. The epic positions the Ethiopian kings and emperors as the direct heirs of the Solomonic dynasty, as the king of kings. It relates Menelik I's acquisition of a highly sacred object, the Ark of the Covenant, and its transportation from Israel with the aid of red-headed angels. So what do we know about the recipient of the Bodleian manuscripts? We know that in the early 1770s, he was a courtier at the Ethiopian Imperial Court in Gondar, located in the Northern Highlands, which had been the seat of royal power since 1636. He could trace his lineage back to this 14th century Scottish warrior king, Robert the Bruce, and he was a member of a secret fraternal organization in Edinburgh, the Scottish Freemasons, which upheld the Ark of the Covenant as a divine Masonic structure. His grand tour of Europe was unlike the standard exercises of his peers, because in 1768, it detoured to Ethiopia. On his return to, Ethi to Britain in 1772, he would disseminate Ethiopian manuscripts among the powers and monarchies of Europe, including three copies of the Book of Enoch. And this was a manuscript which would exert a strong influence on British art and literary history. He would present his drawings of African antiquities to the British King, King George III. And years later, he would incorporate information from his collection of meticulously studied Ethiopian manuscripts into his travel log, an account of Ethiopian history and culture presented for a European audience. You don't immediately notice him among the gaggle of grand tourists in Johann Zoffany's group portrait, The Tribuna of the Uffizi. He stands at the very edge of the painting and directly meets our gaze. This towering red-haired figure is James Bruce of Kinnaird. Raz Michael and James Bruce had met at the Ethiopian Imperial Court in Gondar. The teenage emperor Tekla Hymenot II was on the throne, but the aging Raz Michael was said to be the real ruler of Ethiopia. And despite its constantly changing physical location throughout Ethiopia, the court had traditionally been a nexus of cultural interchange between Europeans and Ethiopians for centuries. According to David Perry, during the late Middle Ages, Ethiopian emperors saw Europe as a strange distant land of myth and wonder, a place from which they could extract religious souvenirs to further their local political goals. They actively perpetuated the myth, which was initially a European invention, that the Ethiopian emperor was the legendary Christian king, Prester John. So you see in letters to European monarchs that the, from the king of Ethiopia, that he offers his aid as Prester John as a Christian ally in the Crusades. European artists would be summoned to the Ethiopian court to create religious and royal artifacts that fuse together African and European styles and materials. However, by 1633, Ethiopia closed off to foreign influence. The attempt of the Portuguese Jesuits to convert the already Christian Ethiopians to Catholicism had been viewed by the 17th century Emperor, Emperor Fasilides as an attempt at proto-colonization. As a result, they were expelled from the country. In the 18th century, the Ethiopian landscape was dotted with the ruins of Jesuit churches, 
as a material testament to this breaking down of relations. And for a century, the only European to set foot on Ethiopian soil had been the French apothecary, Dr. Charles Jacques Poncet. Resistance to foreign invasion was sustained throughout the early modern and modern periods. And it's often overlooked that Ethiopia was never colonized, despite um, a brief period under Mussolini in the 1930s. And studies relate little to the 18th century Ethiopian-European encounter. A better picture, more fuller picture of Ethiopian-European di diplomatic relations may provide insights into the ability of Ethiopian emperors to resist colonization so successfully. Arriving in a land hostile to Europeans, Bruce, Bruce apparently gifted his way through Ethiopia on the route to Gondar. It was his knowledge of medicine that gained him access to the court, where he soon established the trust of the ruling family, becoming the Lord of the Bedchamber to the Emperor. A Protestant, he bonded with the Itiga, the equivalent of the Queen Mother, over their shared distrust of Catholics. And with his red hair curled and perfumed in the Ethiopian fashion, he was a Balamal, a court favorite. And as a result, he gained a unique insight into 18th century Europe, the 18th century Ethiopian court. While at court, Bruce purchased and commissioned copies of Ethiopian manuscripts. It's possible that this gifted manuscripts in the Bodleian was a personalized gift to Bruce. The collection of Ethiopian artifacts that Bruce brought with him to Europe is a result of a shared Christian faith. Yet, Ras Michael's gift reveals the wider ramifications of his political astuteness. It appears that he shrewdly recruited the antiquarian impulses of the grand tourist Bruce. And back in Britain, Bruce would incorporate information from the Kebron Lagast and other manuscripts in his collection into his travelogue titled Travels to Discover the Source of the Nile. Towards the end of the second volume, he includes a section, The Annals of Abyssinia, a summary of Ethiopian royal history from the 13th century to 1769, but he also includes an additional section, the cultivation of Michael's friendship, effectively writing Ras Michael into history. The portrait of Ras Michael in the guise of a victorious classical emperor adorns the front pages of Bruce's travelogue, his image converted into a European emblem of power. Early modern Ethiopian emperors would continuously change the location of their court to assert their power within a tumultuous political landscape. In a similar way, Ras Michael was making his presence known within the textual territory of a European travelogue. During his grand tour of Europe, Bruce had come across the 17th century publication titled A New History of Ethiopia. It's a foundational text for scholars of Ethiopian studies to this day, and is the result of an exchange between a German scholar, Job Ludolf, and an Ethiopian monk, Abra Gregorius, at the ducal court of Ernest I in Gotha. As an agent of Ethiopian antiquarianism, Bruce had to negotiate between two cultures of knowledge, British and Ethiopian. The way that Bruce wrote his 1790 um, travelogue was unorthodox. 16 years after his visit to Ethiopia, Bruce sat down and recited an eyewitness account to his assistant, Benjamin Latrobe. According to Bruce's 19th century biographer, the Scottish Orientalist Alexander Murray, Latrobe tried to provide coherency to his confused narrative where memory melted into imagination. However, Bruce's account reenacted the tradition of the Kebranagas, the classic of Ethiopian historiography, because as E.A. Wallace Budge noted, the 14th century epic is a great storehouse of legends and traditions, some historical and some of a purely folklore character derived from the Old Testament and the later rabbinic writings and from Egyptian, Arabian and Ethiopian sources. In European collections, Ethiopian manuscripts have been subject to miscategorization, subsumed into the category of Oriental collections. The evolution of Ethiopian studies 
as a discipline linked to 18th century antiquarianism has received little scholarly attention. A closer look at the encounter between Raz Michael and James Bruce offers the opportunity to critically assess the co-production of Africa of in Enlightenment Europe. Thank you. Thanks very much, all of the panelists. Um, if you don't mind um, turning your cameras back on, um, panelists, and we will, as, you, as usual, uh, allow some time for you guys to ask each other questions um, before we open it up um, to wider discussion. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you guys have any questions for each other. Does anybody wanna ask each other a question? Before we go. Before we go on. Um, maybe just uh, a really small question for um, for Antonio. Um, thank you for a fascinating paper, and and the same goes to to you, Anne, and to you, Nestlea. Thank you for your, your your brilliant papers. Um, Antonio, I was just interested in, in the the different genres that that come together in your work, and, and thinking about the way in which travel writing is able to offer some sort of counterpoint to, to literary traditions that have come before, but also um, it was really interesting uh, hearing and, and reading the moments where you think about the, the genre of the saga and that sense of a kind of a national epic and all of the traditions that went into constructing those particular Ethiopian sagas. Um, I'd wondered if there was anything you want to say about, about the saga or, or anything about the, the, kind of the, the merging together of different genres, creation of different genres during this time period. That's a fantastic question, Daniel. Thank you so much for that. That is really, really kind. And um, that is a really interesting point because also, as you said, when you're talking about nationalism, 18th century in Europe, we often talk about how that was the rise of nationalism uh, during Enlightenment Europe and all the different myths that go together um, to create these senses of nationalism. Um, what is really interesting, as you said, with also travel writing and it's this sort of mesh of all these different traditions that come together, especially in, in this research, it's looking at Ethiopian and British, and that almost, in a sense, that sort of clash that happens because um, when Bruce in, incorporates his Ethiopian manuscripts into his uh, travel log, his biographer, Alexander Murray, essentially acts, but he's an Orientalist, but he sort of acts as an editor, a biographer, and a corrector. <laughs> And um, he goes through his collection of manuscripts at Kinnaird House, where, which was the family residence uh, house of Bruce. Um, and very interestingly, he goes through these manuscripts and he, in the second edition, which was published in 1805, he inserts some more of these manuscripts, including after quite a lot of work about the Kebra Nagast, um, into, the, into the second volume, um, with an introduction about Bruce. Um, and from what I can see, it was the, the Bruce family that asked him to be the biographer, which is also very interesting that they'd ask an Orientalist um, to, to put, you know, to study these manuscripts further and carry on his work. Um, but what we see is um, in my presentation, I was looking at the dialogue, the sort of cultural exchange at the Ethiopian court with Europeans, which we also see in this encounter in the 18th century with Raz Michael and James Bruce. Um, but in Kinnaird House back in Scotland, in Stirlingshire, um, in the sort of early 19th century, around about 1802, 1803, we see that Alexander Murray is sending letters to an English artist called Henry Salt. Um, and asking him to go back, go and retrace his footsteps uh, to basically corroborate what he'd seen, uh, what Bruce had seen. Um, so that in a sense, there's this sort of, um, there's all these letters being exchanged while this travelogue is being created. Um, and Henry Salt is going for different purposes than Bruce. He's going to Ethiopia to open commercial contact. But it's this sort of critical dialogue that's happening as a travelogue, even the same one sort of morphs through time, um, which is very interesting. And also with Bruce, he's talking, he's talking about um, the Jesuits, the, the knowledge of Ethiopia that was uh, 
created by the Portuguese Jesuits when he went to um, Ethiopia and critically having like a sort of critical dialogue with them as well and saying it wasn't right that they discovered the source of the Nile so I'm you know I discovered the source of the Nile it's very interesting um, and with the Kebra Nagast it's obviously interesting that that was a gifted manuscript um, and it's showing that that was a a sense of the what, an image of Ethiopia that a ruler, somebody with interests um, as a ruler in Ethiopia, wanted to portray to Enlightenment Europe at this time also of emerging nationalism as well. It's really, really interesting. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Thank you. I have a sort of follow-on question, which I think again sort of links everybody together, which is like. And actually sort of links back to Mark's um, answer to my question in the last panel, which is like, to what extent are, is there people wanting to be known and remembered and, and also a case of wanting to be forgotten? So I was thinking about, and your, your presentation and the fact that you were saying that it's, that the, re, the Dendi is known as sort of being wild and dangerous. Um, and, um, you know, Futa Jalan has a, has a similar reputation in the 19th century. And I, and I always, and I was just sort of wondering, like, is that a cultivated reputation? You know, like if you're trying to avoid the, you know, predatory slave trading states, is it worth being sort of being forgotten? Um, you know, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously in Antonia's case, you know, and 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 I guess a bit in in Daniela's case, like there there's an attempt to be remembered, but um, but I I guess thinking about um, what Natalie was saying about sort of walling up the, the library so that they can't go in and they don't know about it um, made me made me think about whether whether there's any sort of active role of forgetting happening in your case. Well, in our case, it's um, it's probably intentional. The the people of the area portray the ancestors as, as uh, um, parasitic on caravans, warriors, quite uh, dangerous people. And Ali, who is here and excavated in one of those places, can tell us more about that. But um, yes, it's, it's more the opposite. I think they, this is a constructed image that these, these people have created. And it looks like there was a vacuum and a whole range of successive communities occupied that space, um, each of which probably tried to make sure its predecessors were, were forgotten. That's how it's looking to us at this point in time anyway. Um, I may add something for Olivier there, there, because when we were at the tip of our fieldwork area, we, we arrived in a village where we were welcomed heart, really um, warmly by uh, people who said, oh, you're interested in history, but we are, as well, we are very keen in history. And it so happened that there was a brotherhood of historians living there, and they were the historians of the jihad of Usman Danpudu, is that Anna? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, Olivier did the interviews I left for uh, archaeological <laughs> surveys and Olivier told me that uh, I was really stupid I should, I should have stayed with him because the guy actually came out with a, a banner of Usman Dan Podio and a, and a spear and uh, and they had a very detailed rec record of, uh, of uh, the jihad so detailed in fact that Olivier who came and came back to see them years after years for five years was convinced that they had texts. But uh, when he asked the question, they said, no, no, no. So, I, but his take was that they had something because the, the, the storytelling was very, very accurate and structured. And so he thought that there was some basis behind it, even though they didn't want to share it. So maybe they didn't want really to be forgotten. And he, of course there is, uh, playing with the image and what people say about it today, but um, there is still a, um, a form of uh, uh, historical law related to uh, power people and uh, that can be preserved in the wild like this. That's really, really great. 
Um, 